Hello, my name is Dave Robbins, and I'm giving a talk called Getting Naughty on the CAN bus with the Car Hacking Village Badge. So welcome to Las Vegas, uh, the home of the $30 cocktail these days. It's kind of strange. Uh, the badge here, I got, I'll talk more about what that is, but uh, uh, this is the badge. And uh, go to the next slide. What is the, What are we going to talk about? Uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about me, and I'm going to talk about... Uh, the company that um, I run, I'm the CEO, and uh, uh, I'm going to talk a bit, a little bit about the badge. So just give you the basics. So if you don't really want a lot of detail, you can just skip out after that. Uh, we're going to talk about the Pi Pico, which is the the CPU or the the board computer board that's used in the badge. We're going to talk a, uh, briefly about the CAN bus, uh, which is the technology used uh, for networking and many industrial. Uh, uh, machines, including vehicles. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how we can generate and receive CAN data, uh, and then we're going to talk about a couple methods that we can do, um, some of them that you really wasn't easy to do before, uh, this, this uh, new part. Uh, I'll show you the software that comes with the badge. Uh, there's actually a serial console, uh, and then I'll talk about uh, other software for the badge, and then hopefully some conclusions. Uh, or related to that. Uh, I've been doing this kind of stuff for over 30 years. Uh, it's kind of my passion, uh, computers, electronics. I originally was a hardware person, uh, but there's just so much uh, software with microcontrollers. You had to learn that. And I did a, every kind of software, starting out with assembly code back in the day, uh, you know, C code, uh, Python. Uh, I did uh, GPU programming, which is really interesting. I did FPGA programming, embedded software, uh, Linux programming, etc. So, and we do all that um, at, our, at our work. <clears throat> I started uh, Intrepid Control Systems uh, in my college dorm room in Ann Arbor, Michigan in 1994, and we've been just supporting the uh, vehicle electronics uh, industry in the Detroit area and then eventually globally. Um, and then I, I'm a dog person, but I'm too busy to have a dog, so I also do, I'm a part-time dog watcher. So now I'll talk about Intrepid Control Systems. Uh, we're a company, we were founded uh, almost 30 years ago. We provide test tools for automotive. We're around the, the can hacking a lot, uh, related to can, but we do way more than can. Uh, automotive Ethernet is getting bigger than can now uh, for future vehicles. Intrepid is uh, a global company, around 200 people, uh, offices in Asia, three in China, uh, Japan, Korea, India, and then Europe. We have uh, Germany and, and Carlsruhe and the uh, UK. We are a partner for the OEM, so uh, a lot of the equipment we develop is basically on their specification, and we're kind of like farther, uh, our new products are stuff that will appear in, at, in, in production like three to five years out. So some of our new products like Ethernet and things like that, uh, and Car Hacking Village, you know, 2026, uh, that, you know, that technology, we'll be working on that. I'm also looking to combine with the Packet Hacking Village because it's really a lot of the same uh, technology. Uh, we've been working on cybersecurity tools for a long time. Foundational uh, OEMs wanted to be able to benchmark other companies, so we, t we developed a lot of tools uh, for benchmarking, including uh, you know just figuring out how cars work. So that that we've been doing that for a long time, and that happens to have a use case in cybersecurity, just figuring out how a system works and its flaws. Uh, the aftermarket is a similar type of industry where people want to install a new radio into a and take out the factory radio in the, in the CAN buses as well. So they have to figure out how to make all that work. You might have heard some of our main products, Vehicle Spy, it's common uh, in the industry. Value Can is our low cost CAN, CAN FD, and then NeoVi interfaces, which we continue to evolve. So the latest one, the NeoVi Fire 3, has 16 CAN FD channels and, and two gigabit ethernets. So Intrepid is way more than CAN bus. We do every protocol in the vehicle. Uh, CAN bus is the most fun though, because it's 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 you know it's not too hard to learn and you can get a lot done, a lot of hacking hacking done with it. Okay, I'm going to give a demonstration of the badge right now. Uh, so I'm going to switch to the full screen. 
Okay, so what we have here is uh, the most interesting part here is this is the Pi Pico right here, and this is the CPU and uh, the USB interface for the badge. The Pi Pico has GPIO around it, and we're using some of the GPIO, and we actually connect it to a CAN physical layer here. This CAN physical layer is from Microchip. <coughs> it's capable of CAN FD as well, although we're not doing any CAN FD with the badge. Um, that's basically something that, based on the talk, you could do CAN FD based on, on what I talk about. There's two buttons, uh, and then there's two switches. Uh, one of the switch turns on and off the power for the, the, the battery. Uh, the battery is just uh, used to kind of flash an LED while it's not plugged into the USB, but most of the badge features only run on USB. Uh, so, so basically we have some just regular LEDs that are just powered off USB and then these are actually controlled by the CPU. Um, one of the switches doesn't do anything. The, there's, then there's two buttons and there's, you can hear that there's a buzzer on the back. Uh, the badge itself has a silk screen that kind of explains a lot and then there's a QR code that links to our website that has more information. Just a heads up, some of the silk screen has errata in terms of what pins connected to what. Uh, so for example, the buzzer, it says GP19, it's actually GP20. So if you do uh, sit down and write some software for it, uh, Python or C++ or BASIC or whatever your poison is, uh, go ahead and do that. Um, what, what it does with when you just plug it in is uh, you can push the button and it'll start a countdown. And then what that's going to do is it's going to launch a kill on the CAN bus. So it's actually going to generate CAN messages out of this connector, uh, which you would wire in, which I'll show uh, a wiring setup I got later. Uh, so just to give you an example, there's, there's, if you hold one button, it does one kill. Another button does another kill. If you hold both, it does a, a third kill. And I'll explain what those kills are, are later. But we'll just go ahead and, and try one. Now you can see this LED illuminate. This is the actual CAN bus activity. So we're sending out uh, CAN messages right now. And the idea is that we're, we're either doing a, a type of denial of service or sending uh, incorrect frames. Um, <coughs> and there's actually three different kills, which I'll show you later. But this is uh, never going to let you talk. So I think this is generating zero frames, which if you generate continuous zero frames, that's the highest priority message. It will disable the CAN bus. Now, if you go plug this into your car, things go bad. Don't call me, okay? Because <laughs> uh, older cars not, weren't necessarily tested to be like attacked. So use at your own risk or rent a car. I don't even know. But the first time I plugged into like a, a an old Ford, uh, not with this badge, but I just had the CAN bus. Uh, uh, speed wrong and the whole car just shut down I had to just uh, disconnect the battery and reset the whole car so it's so you know your mileage will vary I'm interested to see what people in the community plug this thing into uh, so that's the basics of the badge I'll, I'll demonstrate the USB software a lot later so this right here are some screenshots of the USB console so if you plug this in <coughs> to Linux or Mac or whatever, and you open up a, a serial console to TTY, S, 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 whatever, whatever USB to serial port it is, uh, this will show up and it will allow you to uh, set up, configure the badge. The kills with the buttons are predefined kills, and then the, mess, the menus allow you to configure out exactly what you want to do. First, let's talk about the Pi Pico. What is the Raspberry Pi Pico? Uh, traditionally, the Raspberry Pi uh, Foundation has been building single board computers that are based on Linux. And then the Raspberry uh, Pi Pico is the first single board computer that is just a microcontroller. So the microcontroller runs uh, almost no OS or little or no LS. Uh, it's lower cost, lower power. It's a lot different than the Raspberry Pi. Now, you might hear something called RP2040. Uh, to clear the confusion is the Raspberry Pi Pico is the name for the single board computer. The microprocessor or the microcontroller on the board is the RP2040. Now with the Raspberry Pi they didn't sell the processor independently. It just you buy the board and then you can't buy the chip and make your own board. 
uh, but that's different with the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now the Pico board costs between four and six dollars, and they just released a ver the six dollar version last I think last month, and it includes Wi-Fi, so you can do uh, Wi-Fi type projects with this that connect to an access point or act like an access point. So it's pretty cool uh, for six dollars how much you get. The board itself is programmed and it's support supported by Raspberry Pi in C and C++ and Python. Uh, so there's a, uh, I believe a MicroPython, there's, yeah, MicroPython port for Raspberry Pi or for Pico, uh, which you can write, uh, you know, quickly write scripts. Uh, the board, it has the Raspberry Pi community behind it, so I think that's what's most interesting uh, to me, is that getting support and finding pe other people that did things. The initial release was last year, and I think maybe it didn't get as much attention as it should have uh, because it didn't have wireless. So now that it has wireless, it'll be really interesting to see how this board does take off. The tools are all free. So like if you've been in the embedded systems area for a long time, it's tools are a pain to get or very expensive. I mean, at work we've paid, you know, $10,000 for a C compiler because you know, for the power PC, because that's, that was all that was available at the time. Uh, but these tools are all free, GCC, uh, Visual Studio Code, and then even a hardware debugger, you can use a Pi Pico to be, debug another Pi Pico. So, the, so you can use the $4 Pi Pico to debug the other one, which you gotta have a debugger if you're doing any serious work. Uh, but the most interesting feature of this board, and the only reason I learned about it is because it's available. Availability of any type of microprocessor uh, chips right now is, is so important. Uh, and you, right now, at least right now, you can you can get these in thousands of quantity uh, for projects. So like at the for the badge, we we bought uh, reels of these uh, months and months ago. So we made sure that we had all the parts we needed. the 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 badge hosts the RP twelve ten microcontroller, uh, which is uh, when it first came out, I looked at it and I just dismissed it as another Me Too product. Uh, but since w it was hard for us to source, uh, all last year all we did was redesign our project products at work for uh, availability of components, uh, which was not, not the most interesting work, but we learned a lot. Uh, so this year I took a look at what was available and uh, this part is super available. and. It's 70 cents if you buy the full reel, and you can buy it directly from Raspberry Pi. Uh, so I took a look at it, and I was uh, pretty impressed with uh, what it what it had. Uh, first of all, a Cortex M0, who cares? But uh, there's a new trend to, uh, to have like microcontrollers that have multi cores, and it opens up some interesting applications, including the one that I'm talking about today. Uh, but the most I think breakthrough thing that this part has is it has 8 bit bang pos processors called a PIO. And I feel like there's so many problems in my career uh, in Embedded that are solved with this. It, it's, uh, it's just a total breakthrough uh, and it's, it's a game changer, especially on such a part uh, that's so low cost and uh, low power, uh, which before you really only option was FPGA, which is very complicated, very complicated tools, uh, very hungry, power hungry, very expensive. So it's kind of, it's a game changer for the industry. Another thing is it's very fast, 125 megahertz, and that's a clock rate of eight nanoseconds. Uh, so you can do a lot. Um, and, you know, things like bit banging CAN bus at 500 kilohertz is, are to, is well, I'm not gonna give it away, but it could be possible. <laughs> Uh, there are videos online where people have overclocked it to, to over 300 megahertz, so feel free to check those out and then use that you know use at your own uh, you know use at your own experience. So if you if you overclock it and you test it and everything it works, that's great. So if you want to bit bang things at uh, you know 300 megahertz would be like three three or four nanoseconds or, or you know under four nanoseconds, uh, go ahead and do that. It has USB, uh, which is really useful uh, for bootloading and, and uh, connecting to a PC. It's 12 megabit, which is th disappointing uh, because the thing is, is that the PIO engine can move so much data, it just doesn't have anywhere to go. It can't go up to a PC. 
Uh, but it's a 70 cent part, so that's that. Uh, it's really great at PWM channels. Using the PIO and the PF PWM, you can generate a P PWM on every pin of this device. Uh, so like things like uh, ser uh, robotics applications where you're controlling servos or uh, you know you have a bunch of LEDs that you want to dim and you know full color LEDs. It's really awesome, and it's got like the standard digital peripherals, and, and the the pin mapping is real flexible, so that's really useful when you're designing boards. Uh, it does not have onboard flash, uh, so it actually has to load code from a serial uh, flash at boot up, uh, which is not so great if you're used to the microcontroller. And there's no code protection, so like. If you design something with this, it will be very easy to copy. And voila, this part is on the DEF CON 30 badge. So this part right here is RP2040. So um, I'm not really sure why they chose it. I'm really interested to learn. Uh, but uh, I would guess having it available is probably maybe a good reason. Uh, and I'm really excited to learn more about this badge this week. And of course, on the back of the badge is the Raspberry Pi Pico, and it's just soldered down. And uh, you can, you, we actually placed this uh, with our machines, our SMT machines. So it came on a reel, it's placed right on the board. And our guys did a really good job where the pins, if you look at the pin, hole pins, they are totally open. So you can put a pin header through the DEF CON badge and you can use the rest of the I.O. So think outside the badge, uh, use the, you know, write some code, use the other pins to do stuff. Uh, have fun. Alright, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about CAN bus. Uh, it's very popular and it's kind of a, a huge focus of the car hacking village. Uh, the CAN bus is also um, used in many other purples. So like uh, a boat, if you have a boat, there's something called NEMA, I think 2000, and uh, that uses the CAN bus. So we were talking about like all the different ways you uh, we can make different badges, like we could have boat kill, uh, they use it on airplanes. You have airplane kill, which no one like that. Uh, no one like that name because <laughs> we don't, you know, we don't want to get picked up by an NSA at, at DEFCON. But anyway, the CAN bus is used everywhere, and all these attacks would work on that. Uh, what is the basic? When was CAN bus created? Who cares? I mean, really, who cares? Uh, it's been around forever. It's going to be around forever more too. So. Everyone listening to this, when you're on your deathbed, you're gonna look over at at that machine keeping you alive, and it's probably running CAN bus. So, and it, it's it's a it's just a great, uh, inexpensive, cheap protocol. And it's it's very robust. And of course, when people say, "What does that mean?" It's like, you can really configure it all around. And it still probably will work. And uh, which is a terrible way to design a system. Ideally, you design the system correctly, and then. Whatever happens in the field, you know, it still works. But I've, I've seen systems over the years where they just take that robustness and use it as a feature. Uh, why did they make the CAN bus? Who cares? Who, you know, go find, go find another video online to, to learn about why they created it. But we're going to talk about the what and the how. And uh, this is just a basic <coughs> CAN network uh, where we have two wires, CAN high and CAN low. Um, I like to think that we invented the colors for can high and can low, but I just remembered, uh, you know, at the beginning, we, we always said yellow is like the sun and green is like the grass, but I don't, it's been so long, I don't remember. Uh, but each end of the network uh, is uh, terminated, so uh, can needs a termination because it only drives the can bus uh, in one direction and then it relies on the network capacitance to pull it back down. Uh, so without that, uh, you, you, your, your bits will be all messed up. And uh, you, we actually have a feature in our product where we generate a pulse on CAN. And based on the, 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 the fall time of the transceiver back to recessive, you can automatically determine uh, if the network is terminated. Um, what does the bus actually look like? Uh, so if you connected an oscilloscope to the bus, there uh, are two signals, CAN high and CAN low. Uh, and CAN high, whenever uh, there's, a, there's a dominant bit, it goes high. And CAN low goes low. So it's a differential bus, so the receiver actually measures the difference between the two lines. And the difference is real important because in a vehicle, 
the ground is used to carry current for all the different parts of the chassis. Uh, so what happens is whenever currents are flowing through the ground, there'll be an IR drop, which will change the voltage at the ECU. And if it goes, you know, if you're using the, the ground as a reference, uh, you can have some real interesting problems. Like when only certain motors go off, uh, you lose communication. Uh, so having a differential network is a huge benefit. Now, uh, how do we get to this protocol? Well, on the badge, the, sorry, the, the, the phi on the badge, this little part, uh, that can cost, you know, between 30 cents and, and, and the last year people were selling them for $8. <laughs> uh, but uh, that part um, for microchip, it, gener it, it takes in a digital logic signal and then it generates the actual physical layer uh, system. So with the Pi Pico, we'll be generating this digital signal and the, the Phi will generate that. Um, what's important when you configure the network? Now, <coughs> when you first look at CAN and they show you this, this diagram, it's just like you immediately have like, you need like aspirin or you know ibuprofen immediately because it just gives you a headache. And like, who cares about time content and whatever? The main important thing about this is the bit time, and that's the length of the actual bit, and then the sample point. Those are the two things that care. So if you got those correct, uh, the CAN bus will work. Now the sample point is when the digital logic actually looks at the bit to determine if it's one or zero, okay? Uh, so what happens is you can have it wrong, but then on certain networks, if you wire it a certain way, uh, you won't, you'll get errors. And uh, there's actually an uh, attack by, uh, by uh, Canis Labs that you can do with the badge called the Janus attack, which messes with this, uh, which I'll have more information about that later. So what do we want to do with the badge? We want to generate CAN bus frames. So now I'm going to talk about how we're going to do that. What's really awesome, and I probably didn't realize this at the start, when I looked at this part, and having two CPU cores in an embedded system is is really useful because normally uh, bit banging is just not possible because you have a you have a core and it's like it's got to handle USB or you know or it has to uh, you know process some data or something like that and you can kind of do some stuff with interrupts but it, it, it's a uh, it's never really deterministic and. You know, you, you can stop everything in bit bang, and that does work. And we've did some stuff with that. But if you do, if you have to bit bang for too long, it kind of, you know, things stop working. So, for example, like USB on this on this badge, it's interrupt driven. So, if you don't service it, uh, it will actually disconnect from USB. So it's kind of annoying when you're using a debugger. Uh, but having a separate CPU core allows you to uh, <coughs> do these bit. bit bit banging and it'll still have your full application running uh, so you'll notice when I, I sent the CAN messages with the badge uh, it sent uh, the CAN messages and the LEDs flash and everything else still works so it's pretty cool now uh, you can have a second core but like how does it use uh, how do they work together and <coughs> with the RP2040 uh, they did a really good job of allow allowing it to operate independently if you use it correctly uh, so there's, there's uh, essential for bit banging is you want to be able to be deterministic. That means when you write the software, it's exactly going to have that that many cycles and that timing and everything. And uh, they did so. So the way you do it on this part is uh, they have a feature called single cycle I/O, which I'll explain. There's something called a bus matrix uh, with SRAM, and then they have FIFOs between the cores so they can communicate. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And all this, all these diagrams are from the RP2040 data sheet, so you can uh, learn more. It's, it's really fun. Now, there's other uh, CPUs that have dual cores out there. Uh, so, so NXP has them, Microchip has them. Uh, I would say, I, I can't tell you if they're done deterministically, although Microchip does have a DSPIC core, uh, which I used to program in, I, I love, but it's only 16-bit. They have a dual core now that runs it. Uh, 10 nanoseconds. Uh, here we go, single cycle I.O. So normally with an ARM processor, uh, what happens is they they have load and store instructions, meaning 
that's the only way memory uh, is changed. Uh, it's through these instructions, which require access to the bus, and they all they're always multi-cycle. So you to do a load, it will have to go on the bus, and then and then the I/O itself is memory mapped, so it will be a specific address they have to go to to change. Now with the Cortex M0 Plus. <clears throat> they have this uh, feature called single cycle I.O. So the logic in the core actually looks at what address that you're running to, and if it happens to be a specific address, it, will ch it can change uh, that logic with one cycle. So the load and store instructions for those address take part uh, 8 nanoseconds. So you can actually, uh, there's, a, there's a register that will allow you to toggle a GPIO, and you could just have uh, inline code that will that you could generate a uh, clock pulse every eight nanoseconds. So you can you can bit bang things you know up to 65, 62 megahertz, you know 62 and a half or half the clock rate. Uh, so it's, it's a really cool feature for bit banging. Now, do you really need this to do CAN? Because like if you look at the eight nanoseconds compared to like a, a standard CAN bit time at 500 kilobits, which is two microseconds. That's you know that's you, do you need single cycle IO for that? I don't think so. But like, if you want to, if you want to do a faster protocol, like maybe CANFD, then you want to have is you know you want to be able to save every instruction. Uh, now this is the other part. So the CPU just exists in the part, and it needs access to RAM and it needs access to IO. So the single cycle IO takes care of of the IO. Now the other part is you need RAM, and you need RAM for your stack, you need RAM for your code, because this, this is a, a processor that, uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 there's no flash or anything. And so when you go to access the RAM, if you have to share the RAM with another core, that's a problem, because depending on priorities, who gets it and, and, and cycles. So the trick is, is they created this thing called the bus matrix, which is actually kind of hard to see right here. But it's basically a logic de a logic device that um, there's there's certain masters, which in this case is there's three. Uh, there's the the core one or core zero, which is the first core. It gets kind of confusing, and then there's second core, core one, <coughs> and then DMA, and they all access. They go into this little box called the matrix. Um, and then there's all these things that hang off of it. And the beauty of the matrix is as long as you're not accessing the same uh, peripheral at the same time, or the, or, or the uh, um, I don't know what the best, let's just call it peripheral, that, that there will be no weights for that, that uh, resource. So for example, if core, uh, core zero is talking to this SRAM, and then core one is talking to another SRAM. Uh, there will there, there won't be any blocking. Uh, so that allows the core to run. Uh, <coughs> allows the core to run with, without any blocking. So it gives you a deterministic clock rate for the core. Now it's important to know if you use this part, that depending on what address you ask these SRAMs, they're striped. So uh, if like you might take one address, but the next address will be on this SRAM. And it's actually a cool thing because it allows, if, if you're running code out of the SRAM from both parts, they'll, 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 they'll not always uh, block each other. Um, you know, so that's interesting. But like if you're going for determinism, you, you can't use that striped feature. So in, in, in the code that I wrote uses one of, the, one of the 4K SRAMs. So all the code and the stack all go in there. Okay, so this is basically a summary of what I just said. The, we use this independent SRAM, or we're calling it, they call it Scratch X actually in the code, and then the second core. Another thing I wanted to mention that I might have skipped is uh, on this first part here, there's actually a FIFO, and this allows you to communicate between the cores, and that does that's also deterministic. So. Uh, core one, there's a FIFO that goes in one direction, and then core zero has the opposite. So core zero can write to the FIFO and not and not block, and then core one can read that FIFO, can check if something's there and use it or not. And that's how uh, we actually trigger 
the CAN transmission. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to do a code demo of, of the CPU uh, bitbang. So uh, this is, this is going to be Visual Studio itself. Uh, so I'm going to let it stop. I'm, I'm back and I'm going to show uh, the code for generating the, the CAN uh, message. Uh, this is Visual Studio 22 and I have a plugin called Visual GDB which has some tools uh, for uh, um, it has some tools for using uh, Visual Studio 20, uh, 22, actually all the previous versions uh, with for embedded processors. It's pretty good. Uh, I'm having some issues with the debugger between the two parts. Uh, but let's go ahead and look at this. Uh, so this, this, this particular uh, file is called uh, CAN Message Builder. <coughs> and this is uh, uh, the uh, the, I'll show you the first step. So basically what ca comes, ha happens is there's an init uh, function here and it looks at what the type of kill it is. So it's an arbitrary kill and then it will uh, load some settings in the kill and there's a uh, function called create can message bits. So we're going to look at that. Uh, so there's this object called obcan, which is an actual, it takes the can message and creates ones and zeros based on the, the information. So we're loading in the can ID, uh, the different pieces uh, of the extended frame, the data, and then there's calls this function called canned bits. Uh, so what it does is it goes through here and it checks uh, the bits and then adds them to an array and uh, I tried to do CANFD, but it's, it's not supported. Uh, but if, if you, it just goes to the different fields of the CAN protocol and generates the bits. And if you go look at this function, uh, it's kind of interesting. It actually does the CRC and the, the bit stuffing of CAN, which I'm not gonna explain in this video, but that's a key part, key parts of the CAN protocol. Uh, so that generates the actual ones and zeros, and then uh, if we come back to where we started, there's this build can message. And what we have here is uh, there, there's this class called arm. So normally you would use an assembler, which is a separate uh, source file, uh, but I've written a C++ class that dynamically generates the Cortex-M0 instructions. Now there's only like 30 instructions uh, in the Cortex M0, which is uh, why I thought it would, wouldn't be hard to just dynamically generate messages, and it, it wasn't too bad. Uh, the, the the instructions have derivatives, so I only really implemented the ones I'm using. Uh, so it'll probably grow over time. What's really cool about the Cortex M0 is the instructions are binary compatible with all the Cortex M. So M stands for microcontroller. So some of the more popular ones are Cortex M3 or 4 uh, that have like more advanced instructions and floating point in M7 as well. Uh, they're out there. So this co code technically will work on those processors. Of course, the delays are different uh, because the, they're designed differently. So some of them have like dedicated RAM or they have a different number of stages and pipelines. So things take longer. Anyway. Uh, what we're doing, the first thing we're doing is we're initializing the program at the address of that particular SRAM. Now the key part about a Cortex M, M part is the addresses that you call have to have a 1 in them, otherwise they, you get a hard fault because 1 is the, 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 the first bit says it's a thumb or arm instruction and the Cortex M only supports uh, thumb. Uh, so, so that's a weird thing I had to learn, lots of, lots of crashing. And, and hard to debug. One of the problems uh, I have with this, with my setup right now, is that the second core is really difficult to debug. Uh, so there's the, the tools don't that I have and I looked for. I, I haven't seen any really great solution to debug both cores, which is kind of a bummer. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're, we're basically generating ARM assembly here. Move, immediate, logical shift, rush here, uh, and then there's literals. Uh, this is kind of interesting. 
ARM is a 16-bit instruction set, so it can only load uh, small uh, constants. So the way they do it is they actually just, in the code itself, they'll have the 32-bit constant, and then they'll load that from memory. Uh, so the, the, the assembler actually all, already does that, but like we do it dynamically. <clears throat> so back going through the uh, code here, here's where we actually generate the code for generating CAN. So we have the CAN, we have the bit buffer, which is just ones and zeros at this point. And we either generate a set instruction or a clear instruction. Uh, so what with the clear instruction, it's just storing uh, data to the, the memory location where it controls the uh, output. So there's a different address for clear versus set. Uh, and then there's a, it does a branch and link, which is basically calling the subroutine uh, to a delay. So based on your bit time, the delay uh, will be different. And I'll show you basically that. And at the end here, we actually build the delay function. And depending on uh, what you're doing, you're generating, you're either gonna, you're gonna build a delay for your bit period, and then you'll build a delay for a consecutive message, and that's called the interframe period. So we'll go to this. Um, so here, uh, it, you pass in the number of de uh, the delay in nanoseconds, and then it generates a, a, a cycle accurate delay um, with an assembler. Now, how did I get this perfect? Uh, I used an oscilloscope and I verified it. So I, step one, I cal calculate it. Step two, it didn't make sense. Step three, you go back and try to figure out what went wrong. And eventually the, the, the instructions or the, the knowledge matched the actual uh, uh, um, the code. So. <clears throat> What's cool is the difference between Cortex M0 Plus and the other Cort all the other Cortex M's. It has a two two stage pipeline, so that means that the branches take two cycles versus three on all the other Cortex M's. So if you want to port this code, that would be definitely a consideration. Uh, um, but the end result is uh, the main core software calls a function called. Sorry, that's the wrong source code. Uh, start, and then we'll call this thing called send message. And all this does is if the FIFO is ready, it pushes a value into the FIFO. And then the second core um, this is process core one. Um, it just uh, basically runs the program and sends the message. And it doesn't show where it's checking the FIFO, so I actually have to go to a different source file uh, for that. So. so here's the actual source for the main. It's checking the FIFO, and then if it does, it calls that function that will trigger the, the send. Uh, so this is the actual initialization for the code. <clears throat> and uh, this is where you start the core. So the, the first core starts the second core, and that generates scan messages. Okay, so uh, now you might not understand that code, but the main purpose of the presentation is to kind of give you clues and give you the idea in your head that it's definitely possible to bit bang digital protocols that in the past, I think we're too fast uh, to do that. So, uh, for example, a CAN frame is uh, uh, typically the 500 kilobits. That's it's, the bit time is is a 200 or 2,000 uh, nanoseconds. So, with an eight nanosecond clock rate, you have 250 instructions between each bit uh, that the CPU can use to to to, to deal with CAN. So, it just opens up some some really cool opportunities. Uh, uh, for, for CAN hacking. Now, uh, of course, now we want to receive CAN bus frames. So how could we do that? And uh, this gave me a chance to talk about the BitBang processor. Uh, so the BitBang processor is, is a revolutionary, it's a huge part, huge, uh, 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 it's a, it's a huge piece of this part. So it's a, such an important part. It's got its own section and, and the data sheet. It's got, it takes up a huge part of the die area, but it's, it's really just super capable. And what it is, is there's actually two of them. Um, and the, the two PIO modules each have four bit bang processors. 
uh, and the four bit bank processors share some resources and then have their own independent resources as well. Uh, and the, it's what's kind of cool uh, that you can there's ways that the, the, the bit bank processors can kind of start at the same time and, and uh, since they're all cycle accurate you can do a lot of really cool uh, coordination between the two. Uh, but it's very complicated, it's not complicated, it's actually very simple, but it's it, how to use it for a particular application. You just have to sit down and look at the instructions and see how it works. Uh, uh, but I, I did this just a very simple crappy uh, can receive. So what does it have? It has eight different instructions. It doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but low and lower instructions are good because it maybe gives you, allows you to do an understanding of it. Uh, it's got FIFOs uh, to communicate with the CPU. Uh, so basically the CPU will throw data in the FIFO and, and read data out. So for example, for like, if you were doing CAN transmission, you would put those those bits from CAN into that FIFO and then the, 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 the bit bank processor would read them out and send them. Uh, from this example with the receive, uh, I sample the bus and then I slide the bits into the FIFO for the CPU to re re read. Uh, there's there's 32 instructions only, and they're shared within the PIO by all the PIOs. So the can receive core I'm going to show, <coughs> or the code, um, it's it's I don't it's it's uh it takes like say 10 instructions or something. All those state machines could run simultaneously with those instructions. Uh, so if you wanted to capture you know eight can channels at the same time, you can do that because uh, it's just it all works in parallel. Pretty pretty amazing. Uh, what are the instructions? Uh, jump. Uh, the jump, it's a conditional jump or non-conditional jump, and it can jump anywhere in those 32 uh, instructions. Uh, it can jump on IOPIN, it can jump on, there's some scratch registers or accumulators, uh, stuff like that. Uh, wait, wait for, wait is waiting for usually a pin uh, to change state. Uh, so for CAN, we're waiting for that start of frame. Uh, so as soon as that goes low, then it signals the start of a new CAN frame. <coughs> in uh, in is in and out are just like USB where they're, they're the direction to the host. So in means it's going to the CPU and out means it's coming from the CPU. So in is is basically shifting data in um, into a shift register uh, and then out is out or, or from pins into a shift register and then out is out from the shift register to pins. Uh, so if you're doing can transmission use out can reception we use in uh, push push. Uh, moves data from uh, one of the registers, either the shift register or the, or the uh, scratch register into the FIFO, and then pull pulls a data value out. Uh, move, move just moves data between the different parts, uh, different registers in the part. And the IRQ is generates interrupt for the processor, which we actually use for the CAN reception. And then set will actually set IO pins or set values of the scratch registers. Okay, so now uh, we're going to do a demonstration of the receive code for Canvas. Okay, so we're back to the, the Visual Studio, <coughs> and this is in a class called CanRx. Um, so just like uh, uh, there was a class that was created for generating Cortex M0 instructions, uh, there's also an assembler that you can write assembly code for the PIO. Uh, but I wrote a class that just generates the PIO. It's very simple. Uh, and I, I want to dynamically change them in code. And honestly, the assembler, it just is, um, it's easier to use code. The only downside is that uh, you have to have this code in your project. So the, the assembler that I wrote is co extra code in your project, where the assembler, if you just use theirs, uh, it, just, it just works just like a C compiler, which is, it, it's actually really cool um, how they did that. So when you learn more about it, but we're just gonna go through this code. Uh, the can receive and the badge is, is kind of not a very good one. It didn't have a lot of time to work on it, uh, but I just want to demonstrate the PIO engine. So it only works at one specific uh, bit rate, which is 500 kilobits. So the first thing you're, do, you're gonna do is set up the clock period of the PIO. Now it can run at eight nanoseconds, but there's advantages if you can use a small, uh, closer clock rate, which I'll explain. So this actually sets it up so you have 32 different clocks per bit, okay? Uh, so the first thing we do, we initialize the uh, PIO engine, and then we're gonna set up the FIFOs. The FIFOs are configurable, and there's a lot of cool things you can do with them. 
uh, but two of the features that I use in this is there's a four word, so 32 bits, four 32 bit uh, word FIFO on in and out, but you can actually join them so they can be all in or all out. So I actually join those 32 bit FIFOs, which means there's uh, 250 or yeah, 32 times eight bits, uh, and that's actually smaller than a, a can frame, any can frame. So you can actually uh, use the FIFO to generate to capture an entire cam frame, uh, which is pretty cool, uh, without any CPU intervention. So you set the pins. We're only using one pin, and this is the RX pin off the can transceiver. Uh, then we start the uh, the assembler. Uh, we start encoding. Uh, I'm not going to talk about wrap target, uh, but we add a label. So for jumps, you need labels. Uh, so this is just like in the assembler. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, set up an uh, inner frame timeout. So this is how we detect when detect when the CAN message is done, is there is a certain number of bits in between the messages. Um, then we're going to go ahead and sit ahead and wait for CAN to go low. Uh, so this false means low. Uh, so this is the wait instruction. Um, now each instruction can have its own delay. So if I look in there, each instruction can have its own delay. Uh, so that means after the instruction executes, it will actually wait this amount of time to go to the next instruction. Uh, so that's where the time determinism of, of the state machine is extremely useful. So what we're doing here is we're just waiting for the sample point to be 75%. And then what that is, is since I set up 32 clocks, it's 24 clocks to the sample point. Uh, so here we go, we're just going to fall into this and then we do a jump and we do a, a jump based on the CAN RX to determine if it's high or low. Now what's weird about the jump instruction, it only will jump on a high. So you have to design your code. Uh, if you wanted, you wanted to do something when it's low, then you gotta just jump somewhere else. But it totally works. It just uses a, another instruction, that's all. Uh, so if it doesn't jump, the CAN is low. When CAN is low, we refresh the timeout. Uh, and we're storing this in this Y scratch register. And then we, we call the in instruction to, to sample the can line and put it, and that puts it into the, the, the shift register. <coughs> and then we just jump um, always back to checking the can line. Now, how, how, why am I checking the can line immediately? I'm actually not, because in this in instruction, we're waiting 32 uh, uh, clocks. So 32 clocks is one whole bit, and I subtract away four because there's actually, each instruction takes one clock. So basically I took away the, the, the clocks of the instruction and then resampled the bit. If can is high, uh, which is idle bus, uh, we sample the bit and then we jump. But in, in this jump, we actually decrement the y, y scratch register. So what this does is it, it, it will, if, if Y is zero, it will, it will not jump. If not, it jumps and then decrements Y. So it's kind of a post decrement. If Y is zero at this point, then we fall through the loop to this, and then we, f we flush the FIFO. So <clears throat> the FIFO will automatically flush when it fills 32 bits. But since the can is not going to end on a 32-bit boundary, we have to flush that data in. Um, and then we, we actually generate an interrupt to the processor. Okay. And then this just goes back to uh, the wait, which is waiting for a start of frame. So this thing is just going to run, and it, anytime it sees the start of frame, it's going to sample the CAN bus till it's idle, and then it will, it will put that data in the FIFO. Now, I call this a crappy CAN decoder because it's missing a key feature of CAN, and that's called resynchronization. Uh, so whenever there's a, 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 a dominant edge, whenever the CAN is driven by the transceiver, uh, you're supposed to check the, the time resynchronization. So, like, if you if you know a lot about you are you you are time the the receiver since it's an asynchronous protocol, it has to derive its own re the sample clock from the bits. So, can what it does is it anytime there's a high to low transition, it, it does what's called a resynchronization, uh, where it, where it compares to where it thought the edge was and then adjusts its clock. Now, I didn't do any of that. Is it possible to do? Absolutely, it's possible to do. It's just more work. And I didn't have time to do, do that in this 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 uh, example, and 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 honestly, with the PIO receive it can totally work. The only problem with receive is uh, acknowledgement. So like the the PIO, I don't think can keep track of which bit is which and decode 
Um, but maybe maybe handshaking with the CD, you could do that. But like knowing where to set the acknowledge bit is is definitely going to be the biggest challenge. Now, normally, if you're just connecting to an existing bus, you don't care about the acknowledgement or you're just spying. So definitely PIO for receive totally could work. Uh, and transmit really is very simple. You generate the bits and then you just compare uh, at the sample point. Is that the bit that I sent? Set, um, is it the same? If it's the same, then your trans your transmitter. If you're not, then you just stop transmitting. So that, I think that would be very easy to do with PIO. Uh, so let's look at the other uh, functions in this. So how does the CPU actually get access to that data? Uh, so every so often, this the CPU <coughs> in its main loop will call process, and what it does is it looks at the message data count. Um, and then it just it just parses them and it changes the bits, it destuffs them so can bit stuffing and then it builds a can message. Now where does this thing get filled up? There's actually an interrupt that's called, uh, so we have an interrupt callback here, and then that is called here and we actually read the read the FIFO into this temporary data, data section, which is basically then eventually processed by the main core, which is this code. Uh, so just in, this is just an example of it can be done, uh, uh, and uh, we'll go back to ending the, ending this presentation, the demo. We have our Pico scope up here, and uh, I'm going to do some quick settings. So first of all, channel A, I have a 10x Pro, and I want the range to be plus or minus five, so we can see the voltage and I have the probe here and I'm uh, going to touch the uh, touch the IO pin of the CAN transceiver all right so it looks like we got a good waveform there uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run one of the kills I don't have another camera on the badge just because I ran out of USB ports uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in here and this is just generating error frames I'm going to set up the trigger. And this little diamond is the trigger point. You can move it wherever you want. So we're going to just put it right there. We're basically just changing train the horizontal. And I'll go ahead and stop that. And we have our curse cursors here. <laughs> now, this is the logic waveform, so outside of the transceiver. And we're going to go ahead and look at, measure this. And you can see we're at uh, almost exactly 16 microseconds. So a two microsecond bit time is, is uh, that's, that's going to be eight, pul eight pulses. Okay, so that's what we're generating with the, uh, with the, uh, that's the, uh, your cans in jeopardy kill. Uh, and then kill with zeros. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, you can do it from the USB prompt, or it's just more fun to, to do it with the badge, you know. All right, so I'll go ahead and run that, and I'll turn the trigger back on. And yes. So the can message. Uh, so you can see it's generating. Um, so this is the idle bus, and then this this is basically can ID zero. <clears throat> the Pico scope has some can decoding features on it. That's really cool, uh, but I don't I don't have time to show that right now. Um, and then finally the random kill, uh, which is not not as much not as exciting. Hold both buttons for the random kill. Now this one generates random delays between the messages as well. Oh. Right. Um, just random size message, random can ID. Um, it will actually generate errors once in a while as well. All right. Okay, so that's the the predefined kills, and let's go ahead and. Uh, I'll talk about the software. Uh, first of all, uh, there's a version number. Uh, I think we're releasing five or six. 
Uh, six has the power management features to run off the battery. Um, so that might be the one you get. Uh, it shows how many message bits you're generating uh, and it tells you the time. So this, you know, standard can message is like 250 microseconds. Uh, and that's this particular message right here. Uh, there's 16 stuff bits. So it's kind of a waste in can, it has to generate these stuff bits. So depending on the data in the message, it's either gonna be shorter or longer. Uh, the bit period, so this is the actual baud rate. Uh, so 200 nanoseconds. Uh, and then transmit count is how many you're going to send uh, when the kill is issued. And that's just for the arbitrary kill. That's this one down here. Uh, and then uh, you can actually gen generate an interframe period that's nanosecond accurate as well. So if you wanted to do like 10 milliseconds between the message uh, response, uh, that lets you uh, see CAN messages. Um, can ramp the CAN data. So that will change the data in the CAN message uh, or interframe, uh, then ramp the interframe period. Uh, that's the, the width between the message you can ramp, uh, you can actually ramp the bit period. So if you wanted to send, you know, 500 kilobits and then mess with the bit timing to see how an EC responds, you can do that. And then ramp can ID will change the can ID. So these are the different settings. So let's go ahead and change the can message. Uh, so this is the can message configuration. Uh, you can change the can ID. The length of the frame, uh, the bytes, you can add uh, invalid uh, CRC, invalid uh, R0, which is a, a common issue that with a lot of CAN controllers, it wasn't defined what to do about that. Uh, you can change the inner frame separation time and the end of frame separation time. So if you want to violate that, that rule where you send a message earlier, uh, you can do that. Uh, generate an error frame. This just generates that error frame that you saw in the, in the, in the, um, Jeopardy uh, kill. And also you can have an extended cam frame with 29 bit IDs and that's what's used in uh, trucking and, and industrial applications a lot, boats. Uh, remote frame, this is a frame that no one really uses, but you know, why not see what happens? So I'm gonna go ahead and and uh, generate a different can frame. So uh, I'll hit three and then enter in some different bytes. Uh, you see, we change the message and then I'll quit. And then what I'll go ahead and do is I'm going to kill the boss here with, uh, okay. So we can see the scope and I'm going to hold the scope probe on the can chip. And then I'll go ahead and, and K. Okay. And then you went ahead and generated a lot of messages. So let me slow down the scope and I'll do the kill again. And there you go. There's there's your message. Now, what's cool about the five 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 is uh, messages is that it's shorter. I don't know if you know it uh, because it has a lot less stuff bits. You don't need stuff bits if every other bit is different. Uh, so uh, let's do something. I'll sh let's let's I'll sh I'll, I'll uh, send um, uh, the kill, and we'll we'll ramp the the can data. So I'll select uh, six, and then there's different patterns you can generate. Uh, walking ones is pretty cool, and that where it just uh, shifts a one through the can data every frame. So I'm gonna do that. Oop. Did you catch that? <laughs> this is where the vehicle spy tool will come in handy to see actually what it's doing. Uh, now, just to show some of the other features, I'm not going to demo uh, the uh, the CAN response refrigeration. And what this does is uh, you can set up a CAN ID and that will trigger the arbitrary kill. So you can uh, transmit arbitrary kill. So when it gets 342, it will trigger the kill. There is a bug with this version where it actually kills the badge. So it's kind of like suicide feature, I guess. <laughs> so the kill kills itself, uh, but you can, re you can just power cycle the, the badge and it will, it will do it. Um, and then there's a can monitor. The can monitor is actually using the PIO code I just showed. And it's, uh, it, it only really decodes the can ID at this point. And there's some issues with the data, but I, the data is correct. It's just the, the decoding, uh, transiting the bitstream into the can messages. There's a bug in it. Anyway, uh, 
that's pretty much the badge. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to be at the Def or a uh, DefCon Village on Friday all day. Uh, I might be there some Saturday. I'm not sure, uh, depending on what else is going on. Okay, just wrapping up here. Uh, uh, there's a company called Canis Labs that had uh, came up with the idea of using the Raspberry Pi Pico with Can, and they made a couple of products. Uh, one uh, is just the Raspberry Pi Pico connected to a transceiver. Um, that's called Can Hack, and then another one it actually connects to a microchip Can controller, so it can do. Uh, can bus and they have an API, but they support Python very well. Uh, the the T CTO of Canis Labs, uh, Ken, Dr. Ken Tyndall, uh, he um, has ported their software and uh, he's he's did a number of talks about cybersecurity online that are pretty interesting and a lot of attacks, uh, but he designed those attacks into his PyPico code. Uh, um, what's awesome is that the, the his can hack board is basically identical. It's the Pi Pico connected to a can pin. So he ported his software to the badge and it's available for download. So you can generate different attacks from a can or a Python REPL. Uh, so I encourage you to learn more about uh, that port and as well as the different attacks that badge can do. Uh, so he's got some uh, research that he's done with it. Uh, so, so please check that out. It's really, really cool and a real great bonus uh, for for the badge. And finally, uh, conclusions: the RP twenty forty. Take a look at it. It's super interesting. The dual core CPU and the Bitbang engine, the high clock rate, which you can probably overclock. You can probably do a lot of uh, destruction to digital protocols. Everything's really a digital protocol uh, now. So, like. Wireless, all it is is digital protocols, you know, and they're and they're on a carrier. And uh, what's what's interesting about engineering and where cybersecurity happens is uh, people are testing things, but they don't test it to the point uh, where they need to. It's, it might be just impossible. It's just hard enough to get things working these days. So you ship the product, and then maybe ten years go by, and then you come around with something like this, and then you. You interact with the protocol in a way no one ever thought, and you you can discover some interesting you know zero days and things like that. So I think this is a real interesting tool for any protocol. This is just an example on the CAN bus. Uh, so you you can use that CPU cycle accurate eight nanoseconds, you know, or 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 less, uh, and you don't have it's not like cumbersome like an FPGA. Uh, so you can do a lot of cool stuff and. Uh, can you do CAN bus with RP2040? Absolutely. Uh, two, 500 kilobit CAN bus, you have 250 instructions between bits. Now you would have to do it the exactly opposite way as I did it. So what I did, uh, I used the CPU to do transmission because that, the arbitrary transmission was the main feature of the badge. And then I used the PIO to do reception. Uh, Actually, the opposite will work where you use CPU to do reception because then you can do things like decode uh, the CAN bus data length, uh, generate the uh, generate the uh, acknowledgement in the proper location, things like that, which you really need you really need to keep track of numbers and do some math. Uh, but the PIO absolutely can do transmission, uh, and, and they, they're, to they're they're totally independent processes. So you can transmit with the um, with the PIO while you're receiving with the CPU. And uh, you can do arbitration by just checking the bits. If you put it on the bus, it's not there, you stop. So it's totally possible. Uh, I'm, I don't I don't know about CanFD. I, 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 uh, there's some bit time changes and stuff like that. I, I, I would have to say, you know, I only spent like a few days with this and there's a lot of creative ways to use the CPU and to use PIO. Uh, so I, I think, you know, someone with a lot of time and talent probably could do a lot with this anyway and the hopefully the conclusion is the chv badge uh that intrepid has designed uh it's pretty awesome and maybe i would like to think it was one of the best badges at least in terms of functionally what it can do uh and, and it's a great value so i hope you pick, get, pick one up we made a ton of them in our factory in uh in troy uh so please uh Take a look, and uh, I would be great to meet you in person and answer any of your questions in, in the village, uh, uh, or uh, contact me on Twitter or LinkedIn. And um, if you're super talented, you know Intrepid's always hiring, so uh, that's that. I put the plug in. 
Uh, but enjoy uh, DOTCON, enjoy Vegas, and uh, have a good trip home.